Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and today I want to talk about common snake ailments. If you keep a snake or maybe a few snakes or maybe you're on a level like I am keeping 50 to 100 or more snakes, if you have a lot of snakes you will probably see a lot of these problems with your snakes at one point or another. And I was actually talking to a licensed veterinarian when I was at the reptile show and she said the number one ailment of snakes is respiratory infections, believe it or not. And I've had my fair share of respiratory infections and I just happen to have a pinstripe pied female right here. This is a beautiful snake. Take a look at the snake. As a matter of fact, I don't have any respiratory infections in my collection, but I thought I'd show you kind of the symptoms and what you can expect to see as far as a respiratory infection in a snake. So, so typically snakes are completely silent. You'll, you listen to them, you won't hear anything at all. <laughs> they are completely silent. If you can actually hear something, if you can hear, especially when they're breathing, if you hear like a little wheezing or a hissing or sometimes they'll, they'll kind of sneeze, that is a sure sign of a respiratory infection. Usually you can, you can hear it before you actually see it. And on, on, <laughs> well, this guy jumped a little, kind of freaked me out. And if you look on the, the mouth of a ball python, usually uh, a respiratory infection is pretty obvious. They'll have some liquid like right along the, the edge of the mouth. Sometimes you'll see a little bubbling. And especially if you look inside of the tub, they kind of rub that. Uh, it's kind of like, almost like a slime. They'll rub it on the inside of the tub. And if you open up your tub and you see a lot of, you know, slime, and debris along the sides of the tub, you could probably almost guarantee you have some sort of a low level respiratory infection. And I actually struggled with a respiratory infection for a long time with my snake Lucy. She's a reticulated python and I actually had her in one of these boa tubs and she had a pretty severe respiratory infection. And let me show you how I actually finally cured okay, it. Okay, so pretty much the cure for a respiratory infection is F10. Use F10, it's, it's a snake safe disinfectant and you actually put it in a fogger. And what I use is I put it in, you mix it with water. I put three mils of F10 in, I think this is about a liter. And I actually kind of shook the dust off this old fogger. This actually goes upside down like this. And then on the other end, you have a tube that connects here. You turn it on and it actually gives you some fog out of here. It's a, like, a, like a fog mist that comes out of here. And what it does is it, 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 it's, it puts the F10 vapor into the snake enclosure. And what you wanna do is you wanna put it in there for I'd say between five minutes and 10 minutes once a day for you know usually a couple weeks. And, and the problem with uh, the problem with Lucy is when she was in her boa tub, I actually fogged her again and again and again. She started getting better, and then I stopped fogging, and she got worse again. And it was just on and on and on. And the problem was uh, not necessarily that she had the respiratory infection. It was because she was not comfortable in that enclosure. She kept pushing to get out. And if you have a, if you have a snake that's not comfortable with their closure, either it's too hot or too small or they just don't like it and I, I've actually heard I talked to some retic guys and I was going through my whole thing with the respiratory infection and some of these guys have been doing reticulated python for years and years and and they know what's really going on with retics I said hey I got a retic in a boa tub and I have this you know persistent respiratory infection what do I do and I come to find out retics when some of them once they get to a certain size they don't really like the sliding oh uh, boa tubs that slide open with the open tops. What they really like is an enclosure with a glass on the front that slides back and forth. And it was really the enclosure type that was the problem. And she just did not want to stay in there. She was actually, she fit in there pretty tight. I would say she's probably outgrowing the boa tub. And it took me a while to scrape up the money to actually come up with the, the enclosure with the front opening glass on the front. As soon as I put her in there, she stopped pushing. And I treated her a few more times and the respiratory infection totally cleared up. So I'd say a lot of the enclosure problems are snake dependent. It depends really really on the individual snake. I actually have one reticulated python here. His name is Sonny. He is a super dwarf 
part Jampei Dwarf, part Super Dwarf, and <laughs> I'm trying to handle him a little bit more. He's a little bit flighty. He's not really comfortable with people, so I kind of try to handle him as much as possible. But he's really comfortable in here. He's never really pushed. He's, he's perfectly fine in here. He'll probably live his whole life in this boa tub as long as he doesn't start pushing. If he starts pushing on the side of the enclosure, that what that really does is it inflames their mouth. And then when their mouth gets inflamed, that, that kind of triggers the respiratory infection. And you can definitely tell their mouth gets really swollen. And when they close their mouth, it's not straight across on their mouth. And you really have to take action at that point. So if you watch my very last video when I was actually feeding Lucy some really big rats. She weighs about 60 pounds. I was feeding her some really big rats and she is on a feeding frenzy. As a matter of fact, at the end of this video, I'm going to feed her a couple more rats because she's going crazy. I'm trying to beef her up so we can actually try to get a clutch of eggs this year. I'm pairing her up with Sunny here. And the, the interesting thing is I fed her a rat yesterday and she missed that rat and she hit the ceiling of the enclosure. She was going crazy. And right as soon as she got the rat she started uh, it was like liquid coming out of her mouth and it was kind of bubbling and it's the first time where I think I've really seen a snake drool <laughs> it's it's a snake drooling instead of a respiratory infection and if you look at her now she's completely fine no liquid coming out of her mouth no bubbles her mouth is completely flat there's no inflammation no hissing when she's breathing she definitely does not have a respiratory infection I thought it was really interesting that when she grabbed that rat it's just oozing this clear liquid and it was just bubbling in her mouth and I'm pretty sure it was actual kind of like a drool like saliva coming out of her mouth versus really a respiratory infection. It's the first time I've ever seen that. And as a matter of fact, I think someone made a comment about her having a respiratory infection because they saw the, the liquid and the bubbles. And really, I think that was, the, I've never actually heard this before, but I pr I'm pretty sure it was actually snake drool <laughs> instead of actual uh, an actual respiratory infection, which I thought was pretty interesting. Okay, so another very common ailment of snakes is snake mites. <laughs> and snake mites, let me tell you, you do not want snake mites in your collection you don't want them in your house they're kind of like uh, almost like lice or fleas they're really difficult to get rid of and sometimes you can have a low level persisting infestation of snake mites which is not fun at all you definitely have to work hard to get rid of them and, and really to see the snake mites is you need like a white snake like this this is ideal for, for looking at snake mites and actually when I started my collection right at the beginning I started getting a lot of snake on the internet, ordered a whole bunch and kind of was trying to beef up my collection, really invested pretty heavy up front and I ended up with snake mites from getting all the, the snakes off of Morph Market. Now I'm not saying that you'll get snakes off a of Morph Market, it just happens, you know, to be, a, a, you start bringing in a lot of snakes from a lot of different collections and let me tell you, you, the more snakes that you bring into your collection, the higher the risk of snake mites. And what you'll actually see, it's really interesting, is you'll actually see like little black specks all along your snake. And a lot of times you'll look at them and you'll wonder, hey, is, is that really a snake mite or is that part of the pattern of the snake? And sometimes you'll just see little red spots all over and you won't actually see the mites. And what I did is I actually rubbed it down with this product. Um, I actually used one product mainly to get rid of my mites. So I'm gonna actually pull that bottle. It's been on the shelf for years. I haven't had snake mites for a long, long time. Thank goodness. And I'll show you what that product is. And what I did is I actually wet a paper towel and, and I rubbed the snake and I came back about, I'd say probably two or three minutes later, opened the tub and all those little mites came out of all the scales and the whole snake was just crawling full of bugs. It was really, it was really creepy. All the bugs just came out of the scales and, and they burrow in the scales and you can't even see a move most of the time when you have snake mites, but you rub them down with the right insecticide and they all come out. The, the problem is, is uh, anything that kills the mite 
is really dangerous to your snake. So a lot of people, you know, they'll ask me, well, how often do you treat for mites, you know, as a preventative? And I would say never, absolutely never treat as a preventative for mites. The only thing that I would recommend if you're doing something like that is probably some kind of like a sticky paper where you can put sticky paper all over something that your snakes definitely won't get in. And, and you know, these harsh chemicals, they're really tough on snakes. As a matter of fact, I took that chemical and I, and I had one snake that was really, really bad. I wiped her down like three days in a row and I almost killed that snake. And if you read the directions, <laughs> you should actually read the directions on any insecticide that you're using on your snake. And it says, don't use more than once. I think it was every three or four days or something like that. You definitely don't want to overdo it. And as a matter of fact, there's uh, the Preventamite that you can spray on your substrate. You have to let it dry. You don't want it, the wet Preventamite in contact with your snake. And that stuff, I've heard horror stories of that killing snakes. So you really have to be careful with uh, the, the stuff that kills the, the mites, <laughs> the insecticides. And, and a lot of people ask me, they'll see, you know, they'll, you know, I'll be opening my tubs and they'll see some sheds in some of the tubs and they'll say, well, you know, the, the, sh the sheds might actually give you snake mites. And actually where you get snake mites is from other snake mites. You just can't spontaneously have snake mites. They're, it's actually an insect that comes from somewhere and you have to get it somewhere. And the problem with snake mites is that if you have a mite on one side of the room within an hour or two, that mite can crawl to the other side of the room. That's kind of what confounded me at first because I was going through all my tubs, treating all my snakes and what I actually did is I used paper towel substrate so I could see the mites and I was going through if I saw mites on a snake I'd wipe this on the tubs down with the uh, uh, insecticide you know trying to trying to kill those snake mites and the problem was is I had mites all through the room and I didn't even know it and it wasn't until I started vacuuming the floor and wiping everything down in the whole room that I finally got rid of those snake mites so this is pretty much the main product that I was using Using on my snakes to kill those mites and it's just called reptile spray <laughs> it's kind of interesting and it says here that it kills mites on reptiles it worked really well it took I'd say probably a month and a half treating with that and I was had everything on paper towels I was going through and uh, let me tell you I was if, if I saw mites in a tub what I do is I would pull everything out I'd wipe the whole tub down and I'd let it dry in there and I put the snake back and finally finally I got rid of those mites there's another thing I, I got right at the end and it's called Provenamite. And as a matter of fact, the Provenamite is banned in some places because it's really, it's really toxic. You have to use it with extreme caution, I'd say. And a lot of people lose their snakes from the toxicity of Provenamite. But I've seen some people, they just pull out the snake in the water, spray down like a coconut husk substrate. They let it dry a little bit, throw, put fresh water in the snake back. And it seems to be a really easy and quick way to get rid of mites. And <laughs> You know, I've, I've heard a lot of bad stories about Preventamite, so I kind of, I bought it kind of as a, uh, an emergency in case I totally get swamped with mites. I would probably go with the reptile spray first. Some people have some good luck with the Preventamite. Either one of these products, I would use extreme caution. So here's another snake ailment, and I would say it's probably the most common ailment of all reptile keepers, especially if you live in a dry climate, and that is a stuck shed. I happen to have this beautiful lemon blast female, and I always have a, a one or two snakes that are always stuck in a shed, and I, I live in a really dry climate. I say the humidity here is probably about 15 percent there's almost no humidity in the air and I'm always trying to add a lot of water to these tubs to increase the humidity and you can see this one just has a little tiny bit on the top where you can just see a little bit and usually what I do is I, I soak them in a tub and, and I use coconut husk and I go through and I give them a lot of moisture in that coconut husk to really hydrate them. And especially right before shed, I'll go through I'll go through all my tubs and I'll kind of mark them if they're going into a shed or not. And if they're going into a shed, I'll really give them a lot more humidity in the enclosure. But the other thing you have to watch is, is you know, I've seen a lot of people say, all right, ball pythons need a 60% humidity all the time. And I would really caution against 
keeping ball pythons at 60% humidity. Because the problem is, is if you keep them at too high of a humidity in the tub, you end up with respiratory infections. So I've seen a lot of people with respiratory infections, I go and visit their collection, they'll have one or two snakes that are wheezing and gurgling at the mouth, kind of bubbling, definitely a respiratory infection. And you look at their husbandry and they're definitely, they definitely have too much humidity in the enclosure, if, if you start seeing mold on your substrate, that's a good indicator of you have too much humidity. You really need to cut back. As a matter of fact, I've seen some people where they recommend keeping them in a really dry climate, except for when they're ready to go into the shed, boost it just to make get them through the shed and then bring it back down to a really dry uh, humidity within the enclosure. And that's kind of what I do here. I keep it pretty dry, except for when they're going into shed and I really try to boost the humidity. So with ball pythons, I'd say probably the final problem that you'll have with your snake is that your snake goes off of food. As a matter of fact, I just sold some snakes and people are coming back to me and said, hey, your snake won't eat, what's going on? And you know, let me tell you, a lot of these snakes, they just have a mind of their own. Sometimes they'll eat, sometimes they won't. And I found really in the dark tubs, like I have behind me, these gray tubs, in complete darkness, it seems like they, they eat a lot better than if you have them out in the open, like in a glass glass aquarium. I mean, there's so many tricks to try to feed a stubborn ball python that's not feeding. And a lot of times it's just, it's just a matter of moving it from one enclosure to another, or especially if you change the temperature. So, so I'd imagine that if I'm selling snakes and you buy one of my snakes, you put it in your whatever room it is, whatever enclosure, your enclosure is going to be different. But not only that, your temperatures are going to be completely different. And in this room, I keep it between, I'd say, 80 and 83 degrees so if you take that snake you put it in another uh, room even if it's warmer or colder even even the trigger of a temperature can make them go off of food for example my my space heater actually went out once and this whole room cooled off it's probably the mid 70s all my snakes went off of food for a couple weeks. It's just that simple of a change can make the snakes go off of food. For whatever reason, ball pythons are just really finicky, and that's one of the things you just have to deal with. Sometimes they'll stop eating for no reason at all. You know, it doesn't matter if you just bought the snake or if you've had it for six months or years even. It just all of a sudden they go off of food, and you just can't figure out why they won't eat. It's pretty much par for the course. Okay, so from here, I want to feed Lucy, another rat, she is in wild and crazy feeding mode. It's usually, I'm on this cycle, about a one month cycle. What I do is I feed her real heavy and usually I'll feed her like three or four days in a row and get, you know, between five and 10 big rats in her until she's really full of rats. And then I'll pair her up with the male and then leave them paired up for about two weeks. And then I'll separate them and then she'll basically go for, for two weeks in that two weeks she'll go into a shed and they'll actually both shed pretty much at the same time which is kind of interesting and then once she comes out of the shed she's really slow to start eating the first couple of rats and then once she eats a couple of rats she goes crazy kind of like she is now and I just walked by her tank and she is like pacing back and forth ready for another one and let me tell you it's pretty exhilarating feeding her rats when she's all fired up and you might even see her drool a little bit she doesn't have a respiratory infection but she is crazy so let's go check her out all right so this is lucy she is my big reticulated python she probably weighs i'd say about 60 pounds she's a really big snake as a matter of fact speaking of ailments she is actually stuck in a shed about a month ago i actually didn't catch her going into the shed and she didn't have enough humidity in this enclosure she came out of the shed and it was stuck and i actually had to drag her all the way up to the bathroom and give her a bath in the bathtub if you look back at the video that was pretty crazy she was climbing the walls <laughs> but you know I got most of the shit off finally you know after soaking her in the bathtub and spraying her down and now I'm definitely gonna watch to make sure I have enough humidity when she goes into a shed so I actually have a really big rat I'm gonna feed her I'm gonna unlock her enclosure and then I'm gonna feed her this rat this is always an exhilarating experience feeding this big snake a rat when she is in a feeding frenzy so let me check this out and see what kind of mood she's in. Whew. <laughs> you can tell she's eyeing me.
Oh! Oh! Wow, that girl is crazy. <laughs> One of these days she's gonna get my hand. <laughs> she just kind of gives me a little adrenaline rush every time I throw her out in there. And she's in a feeding frenzy. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Okay, so one final thought at the end of this video. If you're breeding snakes, you're gonna run into more problems than the typical snake keeper. And <laughs> it was my first really big year last year breeding snakes. I had over 100 hatchlings, and thank goodness I didn't have any major deformities. I did have some, I would say they're kind of runts that were really super small that I had to assist feed over and over and over. Some of them I had to assist feed like five or six times before they would take their first rodent. And especially with ball pythons, they're really difficult on average to really get to eat the first meals. I would say the, the first meal really has to be a live mouse hopper in, in order for a new hatchling ball python to eat. I've tried rats, I've tried frozen thought, I've tried fresh kill, everything. The only thing they'll take is live mouse hoppers pretty much universally across the board. If you try anything else, you're going to be fighting trying to feed those hatchlings and it's it's really concerning if you, go, if you have a new hatchling that hasn't eaten for a month or two months uh, coming up on three months without feeding and you're just starting to panic because you can't get food into that hatchling and you don't really want to go through and force feed your snakes unless you absolutely have to so that's pretty much it <laughs> thanks for watching and i will see you next time